Well, this is the most challenging question that arises when we're dealing with Old Testament issues. Has anyone ever here anyone here ever discussed this with a an inquirer or a critic? How many hands here? Okay, a few. Well, if you if you haven't, you need to get out more because people are raising this question uh, in uh, with considerable force. And so, hopefully, some of the things that we'll talk about tonight uh, will uh, will be helpful for you as you as you process this and hopefully giving you some tools to assist you in that endeavor. When we read passages like Deuteronomy 20, we read lines like, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes, you shall utterly destroy them, Hittite, Amorite, etc. This is a, uh, people look at this and they'll say, this is terrible, how could a good God command these sorts of things? Well, let's unpack these and we'll have to do a little bit more digging into the background like we did last time and looking at some preliminary considerations with regard to the ancient Near Eastern context. Then we'll look at some moral and philosophical considerations and then biblical and contextual ones and then some final thoughts at the end. So again, we'll bypass Richard Dawkins, whom we quoted earlier. You already know where he's coming from. So let's uh, talk about some of these preliminary considerations as we enter into some of those difficult war texts. In the ancient Near East, war was the expectation. Uh, life was nasty, brutish, and short in the ancient Near East. And to survive, a nation would need to fight, or at least uh, if it were a less powerful nation, would have to submit itself to a stronger nation, paying tribute and so forth uh, to protect it. Uh, so this is, you see that in the Old Testament, uh, certainly. So we have this warring to survive, but also, as we've already seen about God in the Old Testament, uh, a God who is willing to forgive, that God desires mercy over judgment. And this also has to do with the Canaanite question, those who are enemies, uh, political, military enemies of Israel, that this is not something that God uh, delights in, but it's, one, again, the situation on the ground. So we've already talked about this. God issues commands with a heavy or grieved heart. He doesn't desire judgment and so forth. But keep this in mind, that when God is talking about the Canaanites and how they're to be driven out of their land, this is already in the aftermath of God's having waited patiently for over half a millennium, including 430 years in the land of Egypt, until the Canaanites would be ripe for judgment. You remember God speaking to Abraham in Genesis 15, saying that God was going to wait until the sin of the Amorites, one of the Canaanite peoples, was, fulfilled, was filled up, had become ripened. For judgment. So this is a patient wait. This is not something that is a, a we're not talking about a, a trigger happy sort of scenario here. This is something that is a slow build rather than instantaneous uh, judgment and, uh, and precipitous action. God is also interested in weeding out wickedness. Remember we talked about the messiness of the ancient Near East. Well, the Canaanites you wouldn't want one of these living next door to you. I mean, they engaged in incest, ritual prostitution, infant sacrifice, bestiality, actions that would have been considered criminal in any civilized society. So this is, again, very serious. It's not as though, oh, the Canaanites have tattoos and we don't, or the Canaanites eat shrimp and we don't. Uh, no, it's something far more serious than that. But keep in mind that Israel couldn't enter the land that God had promised until the time was right. So there would have to be this, this taking of the land or entering the land simultaneous with their ripeness of judgment. And again, this is part of paving the way, part of salvation history, paving the way for the coming of the Messiah into the world through the nation of Israel. But God also reminded the Israelites that they were not some special people, morally superior, 
God reminded them that they were a stubborn and rebellious people and that God would vomit them out of the land if they imitated the actions of the Canaanites. And indeed, that would take place with the Assyrians and then the, the Babylonians uh, in, the, in those two uh, exiles. Now, remember Richard Dawkins talking about this racist deity? Well, that's not the God of the Old Testament. The command that God gave against the Canaanites had nothing to do with ethnicity or tribalism. Notice this text from Genesis 15, where God tells Abraham, who's making a covenant with Abraham, says that this land that was going to be given to his offspring would be the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Jebusites. But these people were not God's enemies by virtue of the tribe to which they belonged. It was because of their wickedness. So, Moses' father-in-law was called the Kenite. Caleb, Joshua's associate, was the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite. Interesting. One of David's mighty men was Uriah the Hittite. And Ahimelech the Hittite was a trusted friend of David. David uh, bought this threshing floor from Arwana the, uh, the Jebusite. And also uh, Rahab was a Canaanite from Jericho who embraced the God of Israel. Other Canaanites, this is interesting. Even in the book of Joshua, there are these strangers that show up on the scene from Shechem between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And they are joining themselves to Israel during this covenant, the, the, the covenant reading of the law, the covenant renewal ceremony, while, while Joshua is reading the law. So the, there are these people, these strangers, with the Israelites, and it's not as though there is some animus against them. They're willing to enter in with the people of God in their worship. There is peace between Israel and the Amorites in 1 Samuel 7. The prophet Ezekiel even reminds the Israelites where they had come from. Your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. But yet God chose this people. Again, we've talked about the working, God's working with messiness, that God steps into this untidy world and gets his hands dirty. In this case, a warfare situation. And uh, just skip over some of the things that I've uh, already touched on, that God begins where people are and then moves them in this redemptive direction. We've also talked about how it's important to withhold judgment, not to rush to judgment about ancient Near Eastern cultures uh, because of our own enlightened modern standards. And so I've already given some of these quotations, so I'll just bypass them and, uh, and move on to the next portion the moral and philosophical considerations. So we've looked a little bit of the background, the ancient Near East, and, and some of the contextual issues that bring us to some of these moral and philosophical considerations. Now, some of these might be straightforward. Others might be a little... You, know, you, might, want to, you might think, oh, I don't know about that. But, let's, but let's, uh, we'll, we'll take one, things one step at a time, and even during the Q&A, you, uh, you can come back with your questions on some of these uh, sticky issues. Let's talk about the depravity of the gods, of the Canaanites. The Canaanites engaged in gross immorality, and this reflected the very behavior of their own deities. The sexual practices of the Canaanite deities involved bestiality, where we have Baal or Baal um, having uh, sex with a heifer, and, uh, and uh, this heifer bears a boy, uh, Baal raping his sister uh, while she was in the form of a calf, that, uh, that we see uh, Baal uh, have, you know, and his sister Anat having sexual relations, uh, El, the father of Baal, encouraging him to, uh, to have sex with his, uh, with his, with his mother, uh, Asherah, who had tried to seduce her son, and, uh, and so El, the father, says, do so, you know, engage in sexual relations with her to humiliate her, which he did. Uh, 
And on and on it goes. I mean, even the god El in Ugaritic text is a poor weakling, a coward who abandons justice to save his skin. Uh, the contempt of the goddesses. One text depicts El as a drunkard splashing in his excrement and his urine after a banquet. And these are the gods of the Canaanite pantheon. And so it's not surprising to see them engaging in these sorts of grotesque actions. The apple doesn't fall far from the theological tree. We also see in some of their law codes, some of these very uh, permissions, uh, the, that, that the practice of prostitution, or if a father and son sleep with the same female slave or prostitute, it is not an offense. Or the Hittite law, if a man has sexual relations with either a horse or mule, it is not an offense. And then they would have magic texts, uh, Babylon and Egypt. Uh, if a man has intercourse with a cult prostitute, cares or troubles will leave him. Um, you, you get the idea here, pretty grotesque activity uh, that uh, we don't have to elaborate on. But, but again, this is part of the way things were. This was part of the mindset. And so, as I said, there, was, there, there are these moral considerations here that it's not just certain differences that the Canaanites have with the Canaanites when it comes to you know, the foods that they eat or the clothing that they wear. It's, it's far more substantive. Keep also in mind the distinctiveness of circumstance. This was a unique and unrepeatable historical situation. God is giving a command into a particular situation that is not the standard or the norm. A lot of people will say, oh, how can you believe in a God who commands this? It's as though God commands this all the time or that this is somehow the norm. No, it is not. This is the exception. So let's keep that uh, in, in, in mind here. God told Abraham to take, uh, to leave the home, the place where he had been born and to go to a land that he would show him. We don't say, oh, therefore God commands all people all his people to do this sort of thing, to pick up and leave their home country and to go to another land. Well, no, we, we take that as something that is unique, unrepeatable, and in the same way, the Canaanite commands are also unique and unrepeatable. God's commands are aimed at the Canaanites as an exception to the normal rules of warfare and combat, which, also, which distinguishes between combatants and non-combatants, even in the book of Deuteronomy itself. Children are not to be held accountable for their parents' wrongdoing. It says, in the very book, one Old Testament scholar says, that speaks about Canaanite wars. We also need to distinguish between difficult commands and impossible commands. There are some commands that are difficult, yes, like these Canaanite commands. But God will not command something that is intrinsically evil. He will not command something that is impossible. God, as the source of goodness, cannot command something intrinsically evil. There are passages in the Old Testament where God distances himself from certain actions, saying, for example, in Jeremiah 19.5 about infant sacrifice, he says, neither, I did not command it, neither did it even enter my mind. So God is making very clear his distancing himself from evil things that God could never command those types of things. Now, here's where we get to a tricky section. So bear with me, hang tight, let's talk about this. There are three categories of duties. A lot of people will talk about the Bible will say, look, all these absolute commands that God gives. I was just on a recent radio program here in London, uh, Justin Brierley's Premier Radio, he is interviewing me, and I was fielding questions from people who had written in as well as a, a live guest. And one of the questions came in about, isn't God, who is the, the source of goodness, why is he commanding laws, giving laws, or issuing commands that are inferior? They're not ideal. Shouldn't God be giving ideal commands all the time? Shouldn't these be universal, absolute, unwavering? And one of my answers was, well, there are certain commands in the Old Testament that are clearly temporary. Kosher laws, I mean, do we, do we want to be prohibited from having shrimp and you know, pork? I mean, Chinese restaurants would go out of business for one thing. <laughs> um, but, 
But, um, but those are temporary ones, clothing laws and planting laws and so forth. These are clearly to remind the people of Israel that they are the unique, set-apart people of God. They're not to be mixed in with the nations and, and so forth. And so this is to be a reminder then that every portion of their lives was to be a reminder that they belong to the God who had made a covenant with them, the creator of the universe. And so even when it comes to my own family. I mean, uh, there were times when I would, you know, our kids are 19 to 27, two of our boys here. And when they were younger, my wife and I would say, okay, kids, hold, hold my hands when we cross the street. Well, today we don't have to say, you know, don't say, uh, you know, we don't say hold, our, hold my hand when we cross the street, kids. In fact, there might come a time when they'll say, dad, hold my hand when we're crossing the street. <laughs> but there are different categories of duties here. We need to differentiate and distinguish here. There are some duties that are absolute, to love the Lord your God, not to engage in idolatrous activity. Those are absolute, unwavering, no question about it. Now, there are other laws, other duties that are general, that they may be overridden under certain circumstances. Keep your promises. Well, there may be adverse circumstances that may lead to postponing or even canceling what one has initially promised. And we understand that. Yes, generally keep your promises. But, uh, but, but again, that may be overridden. It's not absolute. Or don't deceive. Well, there's warfare and criminal activity that require this. I mean, there are the Hebrew midwives trying to save young, uh, young boys uh, from Pharaoh's uh, death threats. Rahab, she deceived the authorities and sent the spies off in a different direction. God himself, when Saul uh, is king and God tells Samuel to anoint a new king, Samuel, the prophet, says, well, if Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me. And God tells him, this is God speaking, says, if anyone asks you why you're going to Bethlehem, tell him that you're going to offer a sacrifice there. So there is a little bit of deception going on here. Why? In order to save or protect innocent human lives. And we talk about the Nazis. And would you deceive the Nazis if you had Jews in your basement? Yes, please do. Save those lives. These people have forfeited the right to know the truth about where these innocents are, and they shouldn't have their lives taken. So God even sets an ambush for the am enemies of Israel. I mean, we are, turn, on, turn, off our, turn on our lights when we go out at night to give the impression that someone is there. Is that engaging deception? Yeah, but, but it's in the face of potential criminal activity here. Here's one that some people may contest that I would say is a general law, but there may be exceptions to it. And it is this, do not take innocent life. Do not take innocent human life. Generally, this is forbidden. You know, do not murder and so forth. But under certain circumstances, it may be justified. For example, if a woman has an ectopic pregnancy, that there is a fertilized egg within the fallopian tube of the woman, but has not implanted in the uterus, if, not, if no action is taken, both the woman and the unborn will die. Is it tragic that the unborn would die? Yes, it is. But it is better to at least save one life than to have both die. So it's done with reluctance. We're not celebrating it, saying this is good, but we're saying there may be an exception to this general rule. I think another one might be if a plane is hijacked taken by terrorists, and a prime minister or president says, shoot the plane out of the sky because it's going to be used as a weapon of mass destruction. Even though it means taking innocent human life on board, men, women, and children. So I'm saying here that while generally speaking, do not take innocent life is a, is a command, there may be circumstances in which that is overridden. Well, there may be those exceptional duties then, the third category, in light of those particular circumstances, those extreme emergencies. Well, what if the question of the Canaanites is one of them? 
What if this is another situation where if there is innocent human life taken, we'll unpack some of these things, but if there happens to be innocent life that is taken, then this would be because God has an overriding reason for commanding it. So when people say, oh, God could never command that, well, be careful here. There may be some, you know, is this intrinsically evil? Not so, according to even these exceptions that philosophers and ethicists will readily recognize. So as we've seen already, God cannot command intrinsic evils, which would be self-contradictory. So God could not command something evil, break those absolute, break from those absolute duties that we have, that would be like saying you have a, a square circle or a, a married bachelor. Those are contradictions in terms. And so it would be impossible for God to do that. But some people will say God couldn't command killing the Canaanites because he's necessarily good. Let's talk about some of these objections. What we could do is kind of shift things a little bit and say, well, because God is necessarily good and wise, he would have a morally justifiable reason for doing so. So if something is intrinsically evil, God would not command it. So, but if God has commanded this, maybe he has overriding or morally justifiable reasons for doing so. So that's one objection. Here's another objection that people will throw out. What if a terrorist claims that God told him to blow up a bus full of children? Well, of course, just because a person claims that God told him so, doesn't mean that God actually did tell him so. Uh, Jesus talks about people doing all sorts of things in the name of God, but being deceived, being misguided. An act would be obligatory only if God truly commanded it, not if one imagines that God commanded it. So there's a distinction that we need to be making here. Furthermore, we can ask other questions. If this person is saying, God told me to do that, well, we have to ask the question, is this thing that he believes that God commanded him coming from a rational, fully informed, loving, just being? And we can ask this question too. What are the credentials of this person making the claim? I mean, anyone could make a claim, but why take your claim seriously? As we look at the scriptures, we see that when Moses is making these sorts of, giving these sorts of commands, or Joshua, it's accompanied by all manner of signs and wonders. Does this terrorist have those kinds of signs and wonders to accompany that claim that God told him to blow up a bus full of children? Uh, no. What about this person's prophetic credentials? Does this person have any, any inside track with God? Does, this, does God somehow give a stamp of approval in some way, like he did with Moses and others? When Moses' authority was being challenged, the ground might open up and swallow Korah and his rebe rebels. Or, you know, those sorts of things. God would show that, no, Moses is indeed my prophet. I've spoken with him face to face and so forth. Uh, not, these, not these imposters. Also, what about the virtuous character of the prophet? Jesus said, you'll know these prophets, true or false, by their fruits. Is this person, you know, is this person have a track record of blowing up buses full of children? Well, that's not the kind of, that's not the kind of person we're talking about. We, we, we need to have a person who is a virtuous character. There may be a certain uh, you know, exception in, in that person's action. But if this characterizes the entirety of his life, uh, there's a problem. So given the absence of such reasons, we have good reason to think that God didn't command blowing up that bus. Another objection. How would you like it if another nation invaded your own nation? Now, notice what is being presupposed here. Now, how, you know, again, how would you like you know, the Israelites going to the land of the Canaanites? How would you like it if some nation just invaded yours? Well, keep in mind the uniqueness of the situation. This question presupposes that Israel is just like any other nation. It assumes that God didn't issue commands to drive out the Canaanites, that God didn't reinforce these commands with signs and wonders. And so to treat Israel like any other nation basically removes the guts from the biblical story. It's sort of like removing Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. You just don't have a coherent story if you take Gandalf out of it. 
So if you take a God who commands, a God who, who performs signs and wonders, who leads the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea and provides for them in the wilderness and so forth, you know, all of these things, if you remove that, then okay, yeah, you've got a nation like any other nation. But that's precisely the point. You can't, you can't let the story have its integrity and then remove all of these special elements from it. If you're going to protest, at least acknowledge that there is a God who is involved here, or at least allow for that for the story to remain intact, rather than just simply gutting it from all of these essential elements that indeed make this unique. Also, when we look at the New Testament, we see that the, you know, that, that Paul and Stephen both and the author of Hebrews recognize that these sorts of things had taken place under the command of God. So it would negate what the New Testament affirms about these realities as well. Now in the time that we have remaining, let's take a look at some of these biblical and contextual considerations. I think this is probably what many of you have been waiting for, but we wanted to set something of a context here for us to embark now on these specific texts and uh, considerations. So as we, as we said, first of all, there are extraordinary signs that accompany the, uh, the Israelites as they go out of Egypt into the wilderness. And what's, what's interesting is that the Canaanites knew very well about this God of the Israelites and, of course, could have fled. I mean, can you imagine? Here is this God who is leading the Israelites with a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night over their camp. Surely this should arouse some sort of question, some, some sort of maybe even fear that this is not the kind of God <laughs> that you want to cross, that you want to mess with. And so we see that Look at, look at the sorts of things that are affirmed. Rahab saying, We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear. We see that the Amorite kings, they, they talk about how the, they, the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over. Their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. It's not as though there's no warning going on here. There is clearly an awareness of who this God is and that he is very much present in the midst of Israel. Joshua chapter 9 with the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites say, the fame of the Lord, your, they talk about the fame of the Lord your God, for we have heard the report of him and all that he did in Israel and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites and so forth. Word has gotten out. 1 Samuel chapter 4 even. The Philistines are fighting against the Israelites and they say, who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. So there is <clears throat> fair warning, if you will. The people of the land know what's going on. They know that there is something very unique about this God of the Israelites. Here's something that may, maybe you hadn't come across before, but we see in the Old Testament, as well as in the ancient Near Eastern war texts, great exaggeration in texts. What do we mean by that? Well, we see mention of total conquest, complete annihilation, destruction of the enemy, killing everyone, leaving no survivors. That is the stuff of ancient Near Eastern war texts, even though, as you read more carefully, you will see that there are plenty of survivors. Are there where, just maybe a verse before or a chapter before, we're told that they were utterly destroyed. How do we make sense of that? Well, again, this is just part of overstate, this overstatement or exaggeration or hyperbole. This is just part of how the ancient Near East operated. They were given to hyperbolizing and exaggerating to create the black and white picture. Let's give a few examples here of extra biblical ancient Near Eastern war texts. We see here from, uh, king, from Egypt, King Tutmosis III, who uses this kind of language. He says, the great army of Mitanni is overthrown in the twinkling of an eye. It has perished completely as though they never existed like the ashes. Well, the actual fact here is that the forces of Mitanni lived to fight beyond this into the 15th and 14th centuries. So it was a premature statement. Looks like total annihilation. But... That certainly wasn't the picture. 
the bulletin of Ramses II. Uh, Egypt had just uh, had a, a less than decisive victory, some might even consider it a stalemate at Kadesh against Syria. But notice this sweeping language. Millions of foreigners, he regarded them as chaff. He slew the entire force as well as all the chiefs of all the countries that had come with him. His majesty slaughtered and slew them in their places, and his majesty was alone, none other with him. Kind of reminds me of recent news here in the UK in football when the Doncaster Rovers lost to the Plymouth Argyle back in March, but yet the coach of the losing team said, we've annihilated them today, absolutely annihilated them, the team in second, and we should have won by three or four. I mean, one, notice that even though he lost, he's using this sort of language. Secondly, so hyperbole, of course, not literally annihilated them, but it was a less than decisive victory here. I mean, in fact, it wasn't a victory at all, kind of like what we just saw in the ancient Near East. So we have a kind of set understanding of that kind of language. No one says, oh, how could you talk that way? You annihilated the opponents. Well, people understand that they don't mean literal annihilation of the opponents. All right, back to the ancient Near East. <clears throat> uh, Pharaoh Ramses the, the, the third has this vic victory uh, where he, where, uh, against the, the, this battle of the Delta against the invading sea peoples, uh, and this devastated Egypt economically, leading to its decline, but yet, you know, and even Philistia would later uh, colonize eastern Egypt, but yet there is this language of we slew them, we, they were made ashes and so forth. They were made non-existent, captured altogether, etc. Again, high exaggeration and a, a, a great departure from the reality. Their seed is, you know, those who reach my frontier, their seed is not, their heart and soul are finished forever and ever, etc. In the Bible, we read about King Misha, and there's this inscription where King Misha writes that Israel has utterly perished for always. Again, a premature statement. The Assyrians would take care of that uh, in, one, you know, a hundred years later. But now let's shift to looking at some biblical war texts. We've looked at some of these ancient Near Eastern ones and a British one uh, to see that there is this kind of language that is being used of annihilation, utter destruction, and so forth. Let's actually look at the text. And what I'm urging you to do is not look, kind of uh, just glance at the text. I'm saying study the text, look more closely. Because a lot of times you'll have just one side of the ledger being emphasized by the, by the critics. Look, total slaughter, utterly destroyed. And then they, but they ignore all of the survivors that are there. What's that about? So let's talk about the Canaanites. Interestingly, we read of how Joshua, especially in chapter 11, Joshua obeyed all that Moses commanded. He did all that Moses commanded. But yet we read in the book of Joshua, even at the end of the book of Joshua, that there are many other nations that needed to be addressed and needed to be driven out. But if that's the case, then what Joshua was doing, if that's called completely following what Moses has commanded, maybe Moses had in mind this kind of exaggeration. But again, keep in mind that if you talk about utter destruction, and you only leave it there. You're not being fair to the text. You need to look at the survivors as well and see how abundant they are. And if you take that, if you take both of those literally, they would cancel each other out. They'd contradict each other. <clears throat> so here are a few texts. Joshua, we read that they left no one who breathed, just as the Lord had commanded Moses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here's here we have Joshua 11. The Anakites in Hebron were cut off. They were utterly destroyed. <clears throat> there are no Anakim left in the land. Four chapters later, Caleb drove out the Anakites from Hebron, that same city. Joshua 10, Joshua and the Israelites had finished slaying them with a very great slaughter until they were destroyed. Okay, end of story. Oh, no, it actually continues. And verse, the same verse, it says, and the, the survivors who remained of them had entered the fortified cities. Well, not just a trickle, but it sounds like a lot of them are going to various cities here. Joshua 10, in the city of Devere, the town of Devere, all were utterly destroyed. Well, Joshua 11 
Joshua utterly destroyed the Anakites in Devere. Sounds like there's some, uh, some, something going on here. Judges 1.8, get this. Then the sons, same chapter here. The sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Okay, pretty much done, right? Well, Judges 1.21, same chapter, a few verses later. says, but the Benjamites did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with them in Jerusalem to this day. At the time of writing, there they are. Hmm, Joshua 11. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by the tribes. Thus the land had rest from war. Sounds pretty positive, sounds pretty good. Well, you get to Judges chapter 2. God says, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. And the Lord allowed those nations to remain, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. What? If you understand the nature of ancient Near Eastern war texts, this isn't a problem. But if you're going to say, oh, no, there, there can't be any of this sort of thing. That, you, you can't have exaggerations in the Bible. Well, then you're going to have some real problems to deal with. So do we have that God will, according to Joshua, or will not drive them out of the land? So we have, we have this, sort of a, this sort of phenomenon going on. We read in Joshua 24 that, uh, you know, I gave them into your hand. And then Judges 2, he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Again, you could have this exaggeration, but then kind of a more realistic assessment of what's going on on the ground. Deuteronomy 7, I think, is a helpful text to see how you have these differing descriptions. You have one, a mention of dispossession, driving them out. Then you have mention of defeat, you, and then you defeat them after you have driven them out. Then you shall utterly destroy them. And then it goes on to say, you shall make no covenant with these peoples and show no, no favor to them. You shall not intermarry with them and so forth. What's going on? You seem to have a, a number of commands. If you try to align them in this perfect Western way, you're going to be very frustrated. And that's why the... Uh, the Old Testament scholar Ian Proven, uh, Regent College in, in British Columbia, Canada, says it should also have been obvious to any Bible reader who reads the, the, the rest of the, the past, the book of Joshua, and into the book of Judges and finds so many surviving Canaanites there, and to any careful reader of Deuteronomy 7, what we just looked at, which curiously, after telling the Israelites that God is driving out the current inhabitants of the land, then urges them to destroy them totally. Uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, as in Deuteronomy 20, and Joshua, uh, and then tells them not to intermarry with them. All of this already raises real questions about the proper understanding of utterly destroy, long before we get to the matter of the typical language of ancient Near Eastern conquest accounts. So you see how all of this is figuring into the broader consideration here. What about the Edomites? We see them uh, in, you know, in, during the time of David. It says that David had struck down every male in Edom. Now, we read about no more males, and then a hundred years later, there's a full army fighting against Jehoshaphat. So where did, where, did all, where did they all come from? Well, maybe there's a little bit of exaggeration that's been going on. What about the Amalekites? The Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15 we read this, that Saul captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. And he says, I have utterly destroyed them. Now, the Amalekites, of course, just prior to this in chapter 14, again, there had been longstanding enemies hell-bent on destruction of the Israelites from the time they crossed over the Red Sea when they couldn't fight up until the present time. King Agag it says you know, that Samuel tells him, you have left many women childless. So King Agag was a real thug. This oppression was continuing. It wasn't as though they were once a wicked nation, but they repented like the Ninevites did or uh, like Jeremiah exhorts that if a, nation, uh, if a nation turns from its wicked ways, then God will relent from the judgment that he had threatened. No, no, no repenting here on the part of the Amalekites. No, it's just continued ruthlessness, continued brutality. But 
That said, notice one, Saul says, I've utterly destroyed them. No more Amalekites. Okay, King Agag is there. But then he's killed by Saul, or by Samuel. David, then we read in 1 Samuel 27 and 30, that he raided the Amalekites. David slaughtered the Amalekites. Again, basically covering the same territory that Saul did in his fighting. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode the cam on camels and fled. You're getting the feel of this here. What's going on? The Midianites, too, that God, uh, that, that the, you, you see this in Numbers 25 and 31, that, that there is this command that God says the Israelites fought against Midian as the Lord commanded and they killed every man. But then we, I've got to skip over some material here, but they, in, in chapter 6 of Judges, 6 5, there is a, an army of innumerable. Midianites, they, they couldn't even be numbered. Even their camels couldn't be numbered. Here they are descending upon Israel. But I just thought that they'd all just been wiped out recently. Uh, so you, you, you get this idea. The Judahites, here's another one. God tells in the book of Jeremiah that Judah is going to be destroyed. Again, this is the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom has already been uh, decimated by the, by the Assyrians. And now God is threatening that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and bring them, these, this army, against the land and its inhabitants. God says, uses the same word as with the Canaanites, I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Well, how long does this last? Well, verse 11 tells us it's only 70 years. And again, the, city, the cities are not an everlasting desolation. In fact, we read at the end of the book, and yes, Israel has been basically disabled, Militarily, politically, religiously, uh, economically, uh, socially, but yet still many people from Judah surviving. So how do we put all this together in the last uh, couple of minutes here? Let's just try to piece a little bit together here. We see, first of all, that there, are, there is a primary command to drive out or dispossess the Canaanites. So if you're driving them out, you're not destroying them, uh, you're not killing them. You're dispossessing them, driving them out of the land. But if there is a, if there are people who are foolish enough to stick around with this God who has a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night over the camp, well, then you're putting your life into your own hands here. So basically, we're talking about two phases, to drive out and then to kill those foolish enough to remain behind. But what we really are seeing is it's a gradual infiltration of the land by the Israelites. It's not this sudden military blitzkrieg in which there's this sudden descent. In fact, God says he's going to help the Israelites in, come into the land slowly because the land would otherwise be uh, you know, open to, you know, they'd be more vulnerable to the, the, the wild animals and so forth, you know, this, this desolate place. So it's going to be a gradual sort of thing. And that's exactly what we see when it comes to even archaeology. In fact, in the biblical text itself, we see that as the Israelites go into these cities in the book of Joshua, what do they do? They go back to their base camp at Gilgal. They engage in these disabling raids and then go back to their base camp at Gilgal. And that's the sort of thing that we see in the archaeological record and, uh, and, and certainly in the scriptures. So driving out of the Canaanites was gradual. And so we're going to have to, unfortunately, wrap up here as we are at the uh, 9 o'clock hour. And, uh, and, and, uh, and basically just conclude, you know, the question is, did God really command genocide? No, God did not command genocide. The issue, for one thing, is moral and criminal rather than ethnic. Uh, the biblical language also strongly emphasizes driving out and dispossessing, and that this comes in two phases, as, as we've noted, and that the Canaanites indeed had ample warning and clear public displays of divine power that they themselves articulated and also, we, as we look at the ancient Near East, we see the language of hyperbole, of exaggeration. Some people say, oh, how could, isn't this deceptive that God used this language of hyperbole or exaggeration? Well, we, basically you say, take the literature according to the way that the author intended it. If he intended for it to be symbolic, like the book of Revelation, take it as symbolic. If it's to be straightforward historical narrative, take it as straightforward historical narrative. But... We read that there is plenty in Scripture where the trees of the field clap their hands in the book of Isaiah. Well, should we take that literally? Be careful about getting hung up on that word, taking the Bible literally. There are some things that we should take literally, others that we should take symbolically or figuratively. But we should always take the Bible 
literarily, the way that the author intended for it to be understood. And sometimes it's going to mean doing a bit more homework, doing a bit more digging in the text, rather than maybe having this word that we stand by, but really doesn't actually fit with how we ought to be reading the scriptures.